Hotel ini juga dilengkapi dengan 144 CCTV dan kontrol sistem yang berada di common center atau office security dan dimonitor selama 24 jam. Di Spot Hotel Yogyakarta, di setiap lantainya mempunyai pintu keluar darurat untuk menuju ke titik kumpul. Dan juga di setiap ruang meeting terdapat petunjuk atau peta evakuasi. Titik merah adalah posisi kita berada, sedangkan garis merah terputus-putus adalah jalur evakuasi yang sudah ditentukan oleh pihak hotel. Sekarang kita berada di The Grand Ballroom lantai 4. Jika terjadi keadaan darurat atau alarm berbunyi, harap tenang dan jangan panik. Apabila ada aba-aba melalui pengeras suara mengenai keadaan darurat dan perintah evakuasi, maka segeralah tinggalkan tempat tersebut. Tim tanggap darurat hotel yang telah terlatih akan segera memeriksa sumber dari alarm tersebut dan mencegah dampak buruk dari situasi darurat. Dalam proses evakuasi, jangan menggunakan lift. Tetap tenang dan cukup berjalan cepat. Jangan berlari saat menuruni tangga darurat dan selalu berpegangan pada handrail tangga darurat. Bagi wanita yang menggunakan sepatu dengan hak tinggi, harap melepas sepatu dan membawanya saat menggunakan tangga darurat. Semua karyawan kami yang bertugas akan membantu Anda evakuasi ke titik kumpul. Bapak dan Ibu sekalian yang kami hormati, Dimohon kerjasamanya untuk saling menjaga keamanan dan keselamatan demi kenyamanan kita bersama. Jangan merokok atau membuang puntung rokok di sembarang tempat. Kami persilahkan untuk merokok di tempat yang telah kami sediakan. Sekian penjelasan dari kami. Terima kasih atas perhatian Anda. Semoga acara ini dapat berjalan dengan lancar dan sukses. Baik, Bapak Ibu sekalian, sedikit menambahkan mengenai public area seperti restroom berada di lantai 1, lantai 3, dan di lantai 4. Untuk posisinya ada di sebelah kiri dan Yun Sewu bagi Bapak-Bapak yang merokok nanti untuk ruang smoking area berada di lantai 4 dan di lantai 3, yaitu ada di ruangan kaca. Dan hari ini, karena hari ini hari Jumat, bagi Bapak-Bapak yang menjalankan sholat Jumat, Nanti akan ada sholat Jumat bersama yaitu di lantai 4 nanti ada di depan berum Mungkin itu aja yang bisa saya sampaikan untuk safety briefingnya Kurang lebihnya saya minta maaf Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Honorable Vice Rector of Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta, invited and featured speakers, Chair of National Sport Committee of Indonesia of Yogyakarta Special Region, Honorable Chairperson of International Seminar on Health, Physical Education and Sport Science 2018, Honorable Chairperson of the First Conference on Interdisciplinary Approach in Sports 2018, Board of Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta, Dean of all faculties, Director of Graduate School, Heads of Institute, Heads of Bureau, all the teens, guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace be upon you all and good morning. It's really a pleasure to welcome you all to the opening ceremony of International Seminar on Health, Physical Education and Sport Science 2018 in conjunction with the first conference on interdisciplinary approach in sport 2018 hosted by faculty of sport science universitas negeri yogyakarta today october this 26 2018 ladies and gentlemen a quick word about this morning programs we shall begin with national anthem indonesia raya a welcome address by the seminar chair will be read after this Rektor of Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta will be delivering his speech afterward. 
almost at the end of the opening ceremony, we will have a formal seminar opening and there will be pencak silat performance afterwards. Distinguished guests, all of participants, ladies and gentlemen, please be silent and bow our head for a moment to say a prayer. Let's say our prayer, shall we? Thank you. Singing the national anthem, Indonesia Raya, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, are kindly requested to rise. Ladies and gentlemen, now let's hear a welcome address by Chairperson of International Seminar on Health, Physical Education, and Sport Science 2018. Please welcome Dr. Mansur M.S. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <coughs> Rabbi israhli sadri wa yassirli amri wahlul qadatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Dear Excellencies, Vice Rector Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta, invited speaker, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to welcome you to second Yogyakarta International Seminar on Health, Physical Education and Sport Science and first conference on interdisciplinary approach in sport held by Faculty of Sport Science, Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta. We would like to welcome all invited speakers from overseas who come from different countries to share their knowledge and idea at this international conference. We organized two conferences with the team community building and development through physical education and sport and integrating sport science intervention to optimize human performance. This event reflects the role of sport science and physical education for developing human performance at this century. Active participation 
from 11 invited speaker and 167 presenter reflected the important role of lecturers, students, researchers, and related background in sport and physical education. They will be organized into several panel and parallel sessions to facilitate main presentation and discussion. Moreover, all selected paper will be published in the international index proceeding. I wish you enjoy this conference and have a memorable time in Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta. Have a great day in Yogyakarta. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The next speech is delivered by Rector of Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta. Now we'd like to invite Vice Rector for Academic Affairs, representing Rector of Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta to address his speech. At the end of which, we would like also to kindly request the Vice Rector to officially declare the International Seminar open start afterwards. Professor Dr. Margono M. Hum M.A., the floor is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Good morning The honorable keynote speakers The honorable head of board of considerations of State University of Chichikada The honorable all of the deans Vice Rector for Student Affairs, Head of Research and Community Services, Head of Education Development and Quality Assurance, Director of Graduate School of Yogyakarta City University, Head of Entrepreneurship Management and Development Body, Head of the Committee of Indonesian National Sports, Distinguished Presenters, Distinguished Participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let us thank Allah, the Almighty, for blessing and guiding us into the right path and for granting all means and opportunities to gather here to attend this very fruitful and tremendous occasions of the second Chukchakarta International Seminar on Health physical education and sport sciences as abbreviated YISPES in conjunction with the first conference on interdisciplinary approach in sports as abbreviated COIS in 2018. It is greatly honored and pleased for me representing Director of Universal Negeri Jakarta, Professor Dr. Sutrisno, MPD, to welcome all of you in this conference. Distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is evident that the rapid development of science and technology confers some advantages on many aspects of lives which make human beings feel more comfortable to be engaged in the nectar of the Industrial Revolution 4.0, enabling them to enjoy the automatizations of some technological products 
and services. In addition, the industrialization era of the 21st century can create polarization where humans become smart, technologically advanced, and highly paid. However, on the other side, humans become dry in terms of morality, physical health, and good values in their lives. In addition to this, the industrialization era, universities, including Yogyakarta State University, play a very important role and strategic role on the grounds that universities, as the center for the development of science and technology, are challenged to become the main sources and references for the development of sports sciences and other disciplines. It is in line with the three pillars the universities of universities, namely teaching, research, and community services. Improving the quality of local wisdom, best education, based education through research innovation, including in sport sciences and disciplinary approach in science, in sport science, become mass so that the children of the nation as the product of education become smart individuals who are not uprooted from their noble culture. Research as the generator of the universe's dynamics will show its quality when the research findings can be references or basis for the growth of new industries followed by social, economic, health, and educational policies which can create a dignified and healthy society. With regard to the above issues, University of Yogyakarta, via Faculty of Sports Sciences, is keen on improving quality of sports and sciences by hosting the international seminar on health, physical education, and sports sciences in collaboration with interdisciplinary approach in sports in 2018. It is aimed at sharing and presenting the reflection and research results related to physical education, health, and sport sciences. Added to this, it is aimed at spreading, spreading lectures, researchers' and teachers' ideas, experience, and research findings on sports sciences and other discipline, disciplines to improve the quality of lives. It is clearly expected that through this conference, researchers, practitioners from different fields and different could, uh, different aspects could share experiences and ideas with regard to the research findings to create better practices and innovation. Distinguished invited speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, to gain the objectives, committee members has struggled hard to invite some experts from different countries, namely Professor Stuart Biddle, PhD, from Australia. We'd like to stand up. Thank you very much for joining us. The second is Professor Jacqueline Goodway, PhD, from USA. Thank you. Professor Chang Sok Ok, PhD from South Korea. Thank you. Professor Michael Chia, PhD from Singapore. Dr. Rakesh Tomar from Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Those are the keynote speakers of YesPass.
The next one is Professor Dr. Ifat Verhagen, PhD, from Netherlands. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Rajesh Kumar from India. Thank you. Dr. Asril Yusuf from Malaysia. And Mr. Fernander, PhD, from India. Thank you. In this opportunity, I would like to express many thanks to them all. Also, I would like to appreciate all delegates and participants who have managed to come to Unibras Negeri Yogyakarta to attend today's conference. I hope that this conference will bring benefits to the participants who participate in this conference and contribute to the upbringing of scientific life. Distinguished invited speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is honestly realized that this conference could not have been made possible without any help from many parties, including the committee members, the Dean of Faculty of Sports Sciences, Professor Wawan Sundawan, we'd like to stand up, and his staff members, and the delegates from many institutions from different countries. It is aware that the committee members have been working all day and night since the beginning of the planning stage, and they, and they now are still here today for all of us, even though they are very busy with their academic and non-academic responsibilities. I highly appreciate their dedication. I do apologize for any shortcomings which you may find during this conference. Finally, I wish you gain a fruitful and pleasant forum and enjoy yourself during your stay in Jakarta. With the great word of Bismillah Roman Rokim, it is greatly a pleasure for me to declare the official opening of the second Jakarta International Seminar on Health Physical Education and Sport Sciences and collaboration with the first conference on interdisciplinary approach in sports in 2018. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. For the formal opening, we would like to request the company of Dean of Faculty Sports Science and the seminar chairperson to come forward, please. Again, with the great, with the great word of Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, the second Yogyakarta International Seminar on Health, Physical Education, and Sport Science, in conjunction with the first conference on interdisciplinary approach in sports, is officially open. <laughs> Thank you. Please stay on stage as an expression of appreciation, Vice Rector of Academic Affairs, representing of Rector of Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta, would like to present a token to the invited speaker. We would like to invite the invited speaker to come forward, please. Please come forward, Professor Stewart. G.H. Bidel, Ph.D., Professor Edward Verhagen, Ph.D., Professor Jung Sok Ok, Ph.D., Dr. Rakesh Tomar, Professor Jacqueline D. Goodway, Ph.D., Professor Mikhail Chia, Ph.D., Professor Rajesh Kumar from India, Dr. Azril Yusuf, 
C Federer PhD PGD PC PhD to receive the token. The next session is photo session. We would like to invite Vice Rector for Student Affairs, Board Member, Deans, and all University Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta uh, Chair. Please come forward. And Director of Graduate School also to come forward, please. Thank you. Please stay on the stage, Vice Director for Academic Fair, Dean of Faculty of Sports Science, Chair of the Conference to receive token from Professor Rajesh Kumar, India.
the next session is photo session for Prof. Siswanto. Thank you. Distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the seminar opening. Now, to really bring a culture nuance and to welcome you all to this very special occasion this morning, we would like to present to you all martial arts from Indonesia. The students of the sports coaching department of Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta will be performing the martial arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pencha Silat. Lupis kutun paris Jogja, Jogja Tetap listis mewah
distinguished guest participants, ladies and gentlemen. Please, once again, let's give a big round of applause for the performers. Now we are proceeding to the next item of this morning agenda, panel presentations and discussion session one. And following the session one is session two and three right here also in this room. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to plenary session one. There will be four presenters in this session. Professor Stuart GHP PhD from Australia, Professor Evert Verhagen PhD from Netherlands, Professor Jung Suk Oak PhD from South Korea, and Professor and Dr. Rakesh Komar from Saudi Arabia. And already with us is the moderator of the first session, Dr. Muhammad Ehwan Zen SPKO. We would like to invite the moderator and invited speaker to come to, states, to the stage, please. Dr. Muhammad Ihwan Zen SPKO, the floor is yours. Well, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, very, very blessed morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me to be here today. My name is Muhammad Ikhwan Zain. I will be serving as your moderator in this first session of this conference. And before we start, let me introduce the experts in this session. We have four experts from the different country. The first speaker, Professor Stewart Biddle. He is from University of Southern Queensland, Australia. And Professor Stewart Biddle is professor of physical activity and health and leader of USQ PAL, Physically Active Lifestyle Research Group. Professor Stuart Research is on sedentary behavior and physical activity behavioral changes as well as mental health. He is the past president of the International Society for Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity and also European Federation for the Phys uh, Psychology of Sports and Physical Activity. Our sec second speaker is Professor Evert Verhagen from Freie University, Netherlands. His research concentration or specialization is in the injury epidemiology. And the third speaker is Professor Jung Sok Ok from Dankook University, South Korea. And the research specialization is about soccer science and training also exercise physiology. Uh, the position is the president of ASEAN Society of Kinesiology and he also emeritus professor in Department of Kinesiology and Sports Medicine, Dankok University. And our last speaker is Dr. Rakas Tomar. He's from King Fat University, Saudi Arabia, and his specialization in sport physiotherapy and athletic. So, please give the applause of all experts, speaker in this first session. And I will invite from the first speaker, Professor Stewart Biddle. He will talk about physical activity and mental health in young people. Professor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much and good morning. My big challenge is to know how to operate the uh, slides. 
Uh, can I say thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to be here this morning. It's a great pleasure. I'm going to speak about physical activity and uh, mental health. I think this is a very important topic. And I hope that it's one of interest to, uh, to the group here. Here we go. I'm actually from the UK, but I made a journey to Australia in 2014, to Melbourne, and then up to Brisbane in 2017 to my current job. And in case you're not so familiar with the geography, I'm near Brisbane in Queensland, and uh, Queensland's a very large place. And we have three campuses uh, across southern Queensland. I happen to be at the one in Springfield. And I'm located in an institute that's a multidisciplinary research institute. And part of the agenda is health and well-being. OK, well, let's get started. Let's talk about mental health. And this is really a level of psychological well-being that we have and obviously an absence of any mental disorder. There's been a lot of talk recently about positive psychology. I think that's very important. We don't just want to eliminate bad mental health. We want to elevate positive mental health and get rid of poor mental health, of course. And the World Health Organization will define mental health in this way. I won't read it to you, but it's very... Um, it's very diverse in its approach, as you can see. It's about working productively. It's about having good um, uh, interpersonal relationships and contribution to your community. It's a very wide definition of mental health. And you can check lots of websites for these kinds of definitions if you want more information. Uh, but it, we can go back to the 1970s in the sport and exercise science literature for some of the earlier scientific comments about exercise and physical activity and mental health, such as this one by Emma McCloy Lehman from the United States. And although she said that psychological benefits have been recognized for many, many years, it's really only recently, this is written in 1974, that uh, there was a developing scientific evidence but a lot of it was a little extravagant. In other words, we didn't have a lot of evidence at that time, but claims were being made. I like to see mental health in this way. You can talk about some rather basic constructs that are positive. You want good self-esteem. You want high levels of cognitive or mental functioning. And you want to avoid too much of the negative, such as anxiety and stress, and depression, and I'll say more about those four constructs uh, in, a, in a short while. But you can also talk about other constructs of mental health, your day-to-day -day mood states, the quality of your sleep is very important, and various aspects of psychological dysfunction. The other thing I want to mention before I show you a little bit of uh, of results that we've looked at recently, and that is that mental health can be looked at in the context of physical activity in at least two ways. You can look at the mental health benefits of doing physical activity in a single session. That's what we call acute bouts of physical activity, like an exercise session. Or you can look at it over a longer period of time, and this is what we call chronic involvement in physical activity. So do people have better mental health if they are regularly active over many weeks, months, or years? And I'll say more about that as well, uh, more, than, more than on the acute side. And it's very relevant for public health. There's a large percentage of the population who suffer poor mental health. The uh, burden of suffering, as we call it, uh, is very extensive, both in terms of health, economics, and human costs. And the potential for reduction of this bad mental health uh, is very extensive. And these are some of the common problems that we encounter 
in our society. Now in Australia, my new adopted country, there was some quite interesting data. A lot of people think Australia is uh, a very positive country with great health and so on. Unfortunately, I, I'm going to disabuse you of that fact, and they have the same mental and physical health problems as many uh, Western countries that are equivalent, like the UK and the United States and so on. And as you can see there, that there are annual mental health encounters with a family doctor, that is to say, people of that age group, young people and young adults, go to see their doctor about a mental health problem or discuss a mental health problem, uh, 1.2 million encounters in, in a population of over 25, only 25 million. And this has increased considerably in recent years. And anxiety and depression seem to be the most frequently encountered conditions that are discussed. Now let me get to some uh, research around physical activity and mental health in young people. I'm going to restrict my talk to young people, that is children and adolescents. And just a few years ago, you'll see there in 2011, we published a paper from an International Olymp Olympic Committee meeting where we summarized the evidence. And we did what was called a review of reviews. This is quite a common strategy these days. With so many literature reviews being published, we try to pull them together and look at the higher level evidence, if you like a, an umbrella review or a parachute review where you look down on the literature from quite a height and see if you can see some general patterns. Now what's interesting about this paper that was you know, relatively quickly put together for a consensus meeting was that it's, it's been quite highly cited a little bit to my surprise. So for example, if you look at uh, Scopus citations from 2014 to, to now, it's averaging about 70 to 100 citations a year. And uh, it, it's actually had 500 citations in total. And this, this a little, little bit surprised me that something as simple as that paper, I'm assuming was well received. Citations could mean many different things, but I'll assume it's a relatively positive thing. And so it got us thinking about whether we should update this uh, review. So the review of reviews in 2012 looked at these four topics. We looked at physical activity in young people and whether it had any effect on depression, anxiety, self-esteem, and cognitive functioning. And we updated it, and this paper has now uh, just come out, at least online, where we did an update of that. But we also extended it to look at whether there is evidence for any causality. Can you say that a relationship, for example, between physical activity and depression is causal? Does physical activity cause reduction in depression, or is it due to other factors and they're simply associated? So we extended the review in, in that way as well as updated the review. So the uh, 2018 update uh, was, was a systematic review of reviews and we looked at reviews only. These are not individual studies, remember. It had to be young people, had to involve physical activity involvement over a long period of time. These are not single studies of exercise single sessions of exercise, I should say. And, of course, you had to look at uh, literature that included physical activity and mental health outcome of interest, those four topics that I outlined, or it analyzed an intervention in that way. So let me briefly summarize what we found. So first of all, there's been a huge expansion of the literature in this area if we include just the reviews. Now, my challenge here is to know where there's a pointer. Is this a pointer? Yes. Okay, so I will look at the screen on my, my left and your right. I think this, uh, this should work. So you can see that in blue here were the number of reviews that we looked at in 2011-2012, and the ones in red are the 
uh, updated number of systematic reviews. So in depression, it's more than doubled. It's not changed in anxiety. It's probably tripled in self-esteem, and it's gone up a lot in cognitive functioning, such that we now have 25, 25 systematic reviews of physical activity and cognitive functioning in young people. I'll come on to that and summarize it. What about the number of individual studies that were included in these reviews? We've got over, sorry. Okay. Okay, so you can see here that we have over 100 papers in the new reviews on depression, nearly 200 on self-esteem and nearly 400 on cognitive functioning. These are individual studies contributing to those reviews. So what about this analysis of causality? I think if you're studying physical education, exercise, sports science, this is quite an important question. If we just take the example of depression, does physical activity associate itself with depression, or does it actually cause changes in depression? And you can look at this from many different ways, one of which is to, to ask the question, how strong is this association? It has to be reasonably strong to contribute to, to causation. How plausible is it? Is it? Does it make sense? Is there a relationship that we can consider a dose-response relationship? This is quite complex. Basically, does more physical activity help change depression more than much lower levels of physical activity? And is there experimental evidence? This is just one way of looking at it. There are many different ways, but this is the one that we've we've adopted. So for example, if on dose response, you could look at it in this way. Uh, for example, the amount of, uh, uh, I'm getting confused now with all these buttons. Okay, let's go back, no, let's go forward. You know, to be, a to be a professor, there are many different things we have to do. One of them is not to be very intelligent. Okay, here we go. So if you look at the curves, there could be lots of different shapes of curves. So in our example, the amount of physical activity on the horizontal axis there, as physical activity increases, what happens to the health outcome of interest? Does it stay flat and then increase like in level C? Does it go up very rapidly and then level off like in A? Or does it go up in a fairly linear fashion like in B? So that's the dose-response uh, uh, relationship. Okay, let me have a quickly look at some results. This is perhaps a little complex, but uh, I'll do my best to, uh, to summarize. So down the side here, you've got those four criteria that I mentioned. So for depression, what is the strength of association? And the question is, how strong is the association between physical activity and depression? with young people, and we've gathered this evidence from the reviews, not from individual studies. This is a higher level summary of the evidence. And uh, you, you can see that there is some evidence for strength of association, but we've said that the evidence is partial. Some evidence is there, some of it is not there. If you look at coherence, or what we call biological plausibility, could you explain the effects of physical activity on depression in, for example, a biological sense through brain mechanisms? And the answer is yes, you could. What about dose response? Do higher levels of physical activity reduce depression even more? And the answer was no. We did not find evidence for a dose response. And what about experimental evidence? Well, we said yes, there is some evidence for, uh, uh, for that. So I'm pressing a button and nothing's happening. Okay. How about I press that one? There we go. So is there a causal link for depression? The answer is only partial. It was not that convincing. 
anxiety. I've been given the sign, by the way, that uh, you know I need to keep moving. So uh, anxiety, we couldn't do that analysis. There are too few studies. So let me move on. Self-esteem. What did we find with self-esteem? Well, you can quickly go down those columns and say that the evidence was partial, partial, no, yes. So that's a simple one. The evidence on self-esteem is uh, on causality actually was not that convincing. Now, before you get too worried about that, this is a very complex area. We should not expect a very simple relationship. So, for example, you might want to look at physical self-worth, how you feel about yourself physically, not just overall. And here's a model of self-esteem that shows that it can be quite complex. For example, ah, For example, here's global self-esteem, but it's underpinned by many different aspects of your physical, academic, social self. You get your self-esteem from many different domains in life. So why would we expect physical activity to affect global self-esteem in a dramatic way? And then finally, what about cognitive functioning? Well, you can look at cognitive functioning in lots of different ways. You can have tests of cognitive functioning, like in a laboratory. You can look at academic achievement as a, a marker of cognitive functioning. It's a very imprecise measure, of course. Or you could look at uh, measures of the brain and the brain structure and function, which is a much more precise but narrow measure of cognitive functioning. And if you now look at how this works here. Is there evidence for causality? Yes, yes, no, yes. So on balance here, I think we're saying, we're saying that there might well be a causal link between physical activity and cognitive functioning in young people. And this is an area that's developed hugely over the last few years. And it gives us a very strong rationale for why we should be physically active, both in schools and, and elsewhere. So a quick summary is that more active and fitter children show better cognitive functioning. Physical fitness uh, and physical activity are beneficial for brain structures when they do such uh, tests. And results for academic achievement are a little bit more mixed probably because of uh, difficulties in measuring it. So the implications here, when we summarize across these four areas, is that clearly we should be promoting physical activity for mental as well as physical health. And physical activity context, or the settings in which you want children and young people to be physically active, are many and varied. Let's get people active through their travel, in their leisure time, such as through sports, at home, through play activities, and of course at school, not only through physical education, but extracurricular activities and active classrooms. We can get active classrooms. That's something you may not have considered. So we brought together hundreds of individual studies here across many systematic reviews and concluded with some mixed evidence that physical activity is extremely beneficial in some areas, particularly cognitive functioning, certainly for, for depression, less so for anxiety and self-esteem, but we need more to learn in those areas. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to some feedback and questions. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your presentation, Professor Stewart Pedro. And now we go to the second presentation, Professor Effort Verhagen. He will talk about the role of sports medicine in the elite sports. Professor Effort, 30 minutes maximum, yep. and floor is yours. Thank you. While they look for my slides, I can already say it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, 
in all honesty, when I was invited, I never was in Indonesia. So I thought that's a really good reason to accept this invitation. And as it turned out, this is my second time in Indonesia within a month. I was in honeymoon on Bali three weeks ago. So. But I just heard yesterday that the real Indonesia is here. So I will, uh, I will check that out uh, later. But it, it's a real pleasure to be here. And it's really good to see this friendly, relaxed atmosphere, which um, we are normally not used to at conferences, which is much more stressful and pressing and all that. So this is, this is really pleasant. Thank you. Um, now for something completely different. No cognitive functioning, no physical activity. Um, I'm, I'm, I was asked to talk about elite sports, uh, but I think most of what I will tell will also relate to physical activity and recreational sports. So um, let's go into that. I'm, uh, I'm from Amsterdam, so this is what Amsterdam looks like. I work in Amsterdam, I'm not from Amsterdam. Actually, I live in a small city two hours away from Amsterdam, so I commute every day by train and I pass the uh, standard windmills. And this gives me time to think about some of the things uh, that we do at work. And the main thing I do at work is find out how we can um, benefit more in our common goals in sports and exercise medicine. So. Even though I will talk about elite sports here, I think we have some common goals that are mutual across the ideas I will, I will say here. Let's take an individual, and every individual has on one side a load capacity, and on the other side a load that is pushing on that load capacity. And if you have that well in balance, your performance will increase. So if you're an elite athlete and you train well based on your load capacity, you will get faster, you get stronger. But if you are a patient, you also need to be rehabilitated well or guided well to increase your functional performance. Now, your load capacity determines your load. So how well you can handle the load determines how much load you will have on you. If you don't have that well in check, your health may be detrimentally affected. If you do too much of training, you can get an overuse injury, you get an overtraining or an acute injury. And that will, of course, directly affect performance. If you're injured or if you're not feeling well, you can't perform well. But it also affects your load capacity. Because if you're injured, you can't train as much as you used to do. So in the end, if you take this all together, I, I would say that our common goals are to provide the opportunity within such a model for every athlete, and maybe also patient, but to achieve and maintain their best optimal performance given their physique. That is our main role in sports and exercise medicine, I would say. So how can we do that now for elite sports? I want to go through that. I only have half an hour. There's complete conferences on this topic. So forgive me if I'm a bit short on, on some, of my, uh, some of my comments here. But I will guide you through, through three things. Um, what is actually the problem? So how many injuries we have in elite sports? How does that affect performance? And what can we do about it? So what is our role in all that? So let's start with the injuries in elite sports. They have very good registries at main events. And here I have, for instance, the Olympic Games. And during those weeks, the medical team reports all injuries that come in in their offices. And what you see is that during these games, around 11% of all athletes come in the medical office with a injury. One out of 10 athletes at the most important event probably in their career sustain an injury during that event. And you would say with all the knowledge we have, we can do something about it, but this percentage, this rate, stays kind of similar across the games. So we do have a problem here. Now you can say, okay, this is like high-level elite, they push themselves a little bit too much. But if you look at, for instance, over years in professional sports, you see the same. You see a relatively high rate of injuries, and it doesn't go down over the years. All you can say here, for instance, even, is that the muscle injuries go up even in soccer. And maybe the game changes, maybe the demand of the game changes, but there's something going on that demands our attention. Now, these are all time loss injuries. These are injuries that are reported by the medical team in, in the medical records. And we know very well that athletes also train while still injured. 
So maybe an injury is not always recorded in medical records, and maybe we are underestimating the actual problem. We know, for instance, that there's periods of pain and maybe reduced function during a season. And we also know, maybe from our own experience, that not every pain or every period of reduced function, we consider ourselves injured. We keep participating in sports. So maybe in all those uh, athletes, only one will come into your office and say, hey, I'm injured, while all the others still have problems. Whether they're an injury or not is up for debate. But if you're looking on the right side, you can see the different in, uh, numbers we have if we look differently at all these injury rates. So if we look at time loss, we have uh, only a fraction of all the health problems within a group of, of elite athletes. This was elite ho field hockey players in the Netherlands. So we're missing a lot if we only look at medical records. So maybe we need to look at this a little bit differently to optimize performance. Now, here we have, for instance, our national water polo team. This is only a limited number of players. This is only 16 players. And the challenge we have here is that they all play at their own team throughout the season, and they only come to the national team once a month for a mutual training session. And it's really difficult then as the supervisor, medical supervisor of that team to keep track of their, their health and their injuries. You only see them once a month. So we sent them every week an email with questions on their health issues and questions on their rehabilitation process. So we can track them over time. And here you see two seasons. So we started in 2017, middle of the season. And this is up to like four weeks ago. I have the data presented here. And in blue, you can see the acute injuries that are being reported every week. In red, this is cumulative. In red, you see the added overuse injuries. And in black, you see illnesses. And now the funny thing, you see that little dip in the middle, that is off season, so they don't report anything. That doesn't mean they're not injured or don't have any problems, they just don't report. You can also see those black bars, the illnesses, those are our winters. So there's a lot of cold and flu going on. And if you overlay this to their exposure rates, you can see it really well fluctuates with their training hours. So this gives us a little bit of a better insight in what is going on. Now, I already said that usually we, we take this of medical records, but if we only look at medical records, we're missing a lot of injuries. That was those, those, that Venn diagram I showed you on the, on the right side. Now, with this system, we can also track health problems that do not lead to time loss. So the next slide will look like this one, but I added the non-time loss injuries to it. See what happens. And if you look at this graph, you see that around 30%, 35%, throughout the season on average, 35% of our athletes report, report a health problem, whether that's an acute injury, an overuse injury, or, or an illness. One out of three players. That's quite high if you look at this to be our national team, our national pride in water polo, defending the gold medal. Now you think this only happens through the season. No, it's not. I already showed you the injuries that are sustained during the Olympics. That's one out of 10 around. We did something similar at the World Championship swimming, but instead of asking uh, about the injuries they sustained during the event, we asked them about the injuries they sustained in the month before the event. So this is normally for elite athletes, like the month before, the, before such an important event, they peak the training levels, exposure, load is related to injuries, so maybe a lot of injuries happen in their preparation. And if you ask them how many show up at the World Championship injured, one out of three athletes reported an injury that they self-reported also to be limiting their performance, and they show up at the World Championship, and they all underperform. They all do worse than they thought they would do. So here's a big gain. Instead of training harder, maybe we should train a bit smarter and, and communicate better. Something similar we found in the same year at the World Championship Athletics. One out of three of the participating athletes suffered in the month preceding the World Championship an injury. And again, that affected their performance levels in the end. Self-reported performance levels. So we didn't measure that. However, if you look in the literature, 
There, there is studies out there that look at performance levels and injuries. And there's a lot coming out from the UEFA study where they track the injuries of all the UEFA clubs and over time. And we have access, of course, to all the outcomes of these clubs throughout the season, but also in the European leagues. And what you see is that the teams with more injuries, so with less player availability, score less in the national uh, leagues, but also in the European leagues. Simply put, if your best players are out, you always have your best players on the field. But if they are out because of an injury, your team changes, your rating goes down, you're not able to perform as well. And this is, of course, not only because you have um, worse players on the field, all the players at this level are amazingly good, but your team is not built around the players that you, you have on the field. So it directly affects team performance. And we see that. And we see that in, in football in this case, but we also see that in other sports as well. Now this is team sports. Here I have individual sports. On the graph you can see the number of adapted, the percentage of adapted training sessions during a season. So these are our individual uh, athletic athletes and they were asked in the beginning of the season, what are your goals? And, and what can you achieve? And then they tracked through the season the percentage of adapted training sessions because of an injury or an illness. And on the left side, you can see an average of 20% 20, 20 adapted training sessions in that group, but they achieved their goals. On the right side, you can see a lot more adapted training sessions due to injury and illness, and they did not achieve their goals. So, here again, you could conclude that training interruptions or training adaptations due to health problems um, are associated, maybe even co yeah, causally associated, I would, would say, with a lower chance of achieving what you want to achieve. So we do see clearly that in team sports, injuries and illnesses affect team performance. If you don't have your best players on the field, your team will not perform optimally. And we also see the same in individual athletes. So there's a really big um, goal here for sports and exercise medicine. And this is elite sports, but imagine this from a recreational athlete perspective. Recreational athletes maybe don't want to run the ten, uh, 10 seconds on the 100 meter, but they want to have a pleasant experience. So if injury and illness kind of pushes down that pleasant experience because you have pain, you'll have a lot of people dropping out for, from a healthy activity. So also there it's important to look at these things. Now, what can we do about it? What we normally tend to do, if you look also in the literature, is we look at one single thing in the problem chain. So we look at an ankle, or we look at only uh, prevention of a shoulder injury from the physiotherapist's perspective. We look at a little stamp on the wall and we try to copy what other people have been doing. That's nice when well, you want to establish a certain hypothesis, but if you really want to translate that to practice, maybe we should turn around a bit. This is actually the painting on the other wall of the Louvre. No one's looking at it, but it's much bigger and shows you much more detail. So the point here maybe is stop doing what everybody's doing, but try to get the bigger picture. Now we tried something like that in a different environment. This is also an elite environment. We, we sometimes do studies with Cirque du Soleil. A bit different than elite sports, but controllable for us. So it's, that's, that's good. And they asked us, the physiotherapist department said, we need to do something about injury prevention and injury risk management, and we feel responsible as physiotherapists to do so. And we said, okay, we can help you with that, but first we want to know how in, in your pool of artists and in your pool of coaches and physiotherapists, they, what they believe about injuries and injury prevention and injury risk factors. So we sat down with artists and, and physiotherapists and we asked them a few questions. This was a full qualitative study, so I make it a bit less important than I'm saying now. Um, we asked them, how do you define an injury? What is an injury for you? And when you look at that, they don't say it's necessarily pain, it's necessarily something that keeps me from, from being able to show up at work, but it's something that limits my performance. Pain is part of the game. 
So if we already look at pain to be an indicator for injury, we're already overestimating what's actually going on and we're trying to prevent things that they don't see as an injury. So that's something already important to, to look at. It's not pain, it's when they believe their performance is limited, which happens to be also an important thing in sports. And if you ask them what causes that injury, they also have that balance between load capacity and load. And they also talk about psychological load. So not only physical load, but also psychological load. And then when you ask a bit further and you say, okay, what causes then load and load capacity? They come with a bunch of factors that they feel are important and that they feel affect their load and load capacity. And then when you ask a bit further, all these things are also interrelated. It makes it even more difficult. And then if you look at the structure of a Cirque du Soleil, and this maybe can also relate to a professional team, you have various levels in the organization that have an effect on the athlete. So we have physical therapists on the left, we have the artistic directors, maybe the coaches uh, in the yellow. Then we have tour management, um, we have real coaching, strength and conditioning, and many levels. And all these levels affect some of these risk factors. Now, you should go back to the original question, and the original question was from the physiotherapists, the blue box, saying we need to do something about injury prevention, it's our responsibility. But then if you look at all the interconnections here, you see that physical therapy only has limited reach within all the risk factors. So being, a, being sta stating that you want to be responsible for something also has an accountability to it. And you can see here that even though the physiotherapist wants to have that accountability, they will not be able to take it because there's many levels in that organization that need to be targeted with an injury risk management program. So that changed their opinion already. And we see similar things again in sports. Let's look again at football, for instance. A few really good papers came out last year saying, for instance, that the coaching style affects injury risks. And this is one of the outcomes here. This is innovative or lateral thinking from the coach. And you can clearly see if that is low, injury risk in the team is higher, injury burden in the team is higher, whether whereas high, your team will perform better because they have less injuries. And the same goes for communications within the team. So elite football clubs with good communications do much better there. So it's not only about the medical staff, it's about the team as a team. And then also players don't train full year round. They have holidays, they have pre-season, they have late season. And we don't look at that normally when we try to prevent injuries and look at risk factors. We look in the past as a straight line, but it's not a straight line. It goes up and down. And injuries don't happen at the end of the season. Injuries also happen during the season. Now, we can register that over time by looking every week, like I already showed you, measure acute injuries, diseases, and obvious injuries, for instance, but we can also add exposure to it and see how that relates to the outcomes. And then we get to the to nice bits because we have this model, a lot of these factors that we are interested in that may affect injuries and injury risk are being measured, but not by one person. They're measured by the team. So we have physical therapists, doctors measuring health outcomes, we have coaches measuring performance outcomes and load capacity outcomes, and we have strength and conditioning. All the information we want to do fun stuff is there. We can do data science with what we already have. We just need to look at it a little bit differently and take that overall approach. So here's an overall approach we developed and we are running at the moment, is where we have athletes putting all their information they have into a database coaches and, and, and um, strength and conditioning coaches are doing the same, and the medical team is doing the same. And out of that database, we feed back the information that is important for these, all these different roles. And that facilitates their communication on the top, so they can talk better. They have better information to talk about. On the bottom, we have research. This has culminated into an amazing database we can use to do with new ways of machine learning and, and intricate uh, predictive statistics to see if we can dig out relationships here that are of interest and that will help us to provide better feedback. We're only at the start of what we can do. And here we have, for instance, 
an example out of that system that measures the acute chronic ratio that provides us the opportunity to provide real-time feedback. And this is, is much better than where we are now. So we have a problem. You know, it affects performance, and we can do something about it when we think about the team. And in that, we need to imagine that we do not win gold medals through injury prevention, but we also do not win gold medals without it. So we're just part of the team as, as sports and exercise scientists. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Efforts. Please sit down. And now, Dr. Rakesh Tomal will present about linkage of sports activities with spiritual and religiosity community, the case in Muslim majority country. Dr. Rakesh, time is yours. First of all, thank you very much, uh, organizers, you know, for giving me this opportunity to speak here. And uh, good morning and salam alaikum, Indonesia. Yeah. yeah. Around maybe six, seven months back, Professor Wan, you know, he, he, he asked me to speak, you know, uh, on the topic which you are seeing on the screen. And it was really a, a challenge for me. And during this last, you know, uh, few months, I, interact, I had interaction with many scholars, you know, many people around the country. I have interacted with students uh, right from the elementary level of school to the university, you know, graduates. And I'll be sharing my experiences, you know, with those interactions. I'll be quoting the experts from the interview which I had taken with the students, how they feel and what, what is their view about the sports, how it is linked to the spiritual, you know, well-being, how it is linked to the religion. And it, it's very interesting, you know, when, when these students, when I talk to them and how they interpret religion in terms of sports. So I'll be sharing all those details towards the end of my presentation. Uh, first, I will, you know, just give some background, you know, uh, uh, of my study. So the topic is, as you can see, it's a linkage of sports activities with spirituality and religiosity of a community, a case in a Muslim majority country. So let's go to the background. Uh, it's, uh, Islam is a religion which has grown tremendously in the history of the world. And Islamic culture refers to the lived experiences of being a Muslim. And the code of living is expressed uh, through Islamic laws laid down in Sharia. Now, Islam and physical education share a very common concern. The central issue being the, uh, the control of body, maybe in time and space, in rituals and cleanliness, in dress, in control of diet, and in pursuit of healthy body. So every Muslim by his faith has ultimate wish that brings him more closely to the God, allows him to pursue Allah's commandments and guidance, and all these provisions of Islam, including prayers and other social obligations, have a close relationship with sport. In Islam, there is a great respect for sports and athletes, as through sports we strive to achieve human perfection and the values of Islam. There is a strong emphasis on healthy life in Islam. The one who believes and practices Islam should not be a weak person. He should be spiritually and physically strong enough to practice Islam. Regarding physical fitness, the Prophet has said, a strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than a weak believer. And this itself narrates, you know, how important exercise and sports, you know, in the life of a Muslim. Even in order to pray five times in a day or to perform the Hajj, you need to be physically fit, you need to be physically strong. And it, is, it itself is a form of exercise when you do the prayer for five times. Now sports and exercise is an integral part of a Muslim's life. In Islam, to be physically active and fit has number of religious, spiritual and social benefits. Sports and spirituality has very strong relationship in Islam. The person who are involved in sports possess the strength to undertake physical acts of ibadat like salat or hajj. 
Now, Islam has a holistic view of uh, or approach towards the life. According to Islam, stronger has more capacity and it is more able to fulfill the obligations towards life and the religion itself. Islam does not promote any activity that will make the body weak and incapable. So therefore, sports and exercise becomes very important in the life of a Muslim. Actually, most of the rituals in Islam are based on spirituality and physicality. Spirituality, religiosity, and sports, how the Muslim perceive it, especially in Saudi Arabia. There are a number of studies that shows spirituality and religiosity are very important and effective to improve overall health of a person. Spirituality should be included and integrated with the lifestyle of a person, and it should be embedded in soul. However, spirituality and religiosity is an individualistic approach and concept which enables a person to connect himself and his soul to the Creator, that's the Almighty. Sports, spirituality and religiosity in Islam goes hand to hand. You cannot just, you know, separate these from each other. On one side, if spirituality integrates physical health with the overall well-being of mind, heart and soul, at the same time, the sports and exercise enable individual to be able to attain those goals of life. So as discussed in previous slides also, Islam promotes the holistic approach towards life, which in turn integrates spirituality in each and every aspect of Muslim's life. Both spirituality and religion are so embedded in the daily lives of Muslim and the religious rituals that it cannot be detached from their lives. Worshipping in Muslim is a valuable act which connects their soul to the Creator. And through worshipping, Muslims are constantly reminded the needs of a sacred connection of their soul to the Creator. The pure life, one of the aspects of spirituality, is the everyone wants to practice in Islam. Now, physical realm is an important dimension of pure, right, uh, pure life. So, and the main aspect of spirituality in childhood education in the Muslim, Muslims is physical care. And this physical care is what? It's a good hygiene, athletics, and good food. So, with regard to athletics or sports, it is recommended that children should be trained in different sports. For example, even the Prophet Muhammad has said, train your children in swimming and archery. Swimming and archery are just an example as being related to the history of Islam and in the culture. Therefore, it is important to consider here that sport and exercise are important features of physical care, which is part and parcel of child's spiritual education. Even though we might see these effects, uh, effects of these activities in the later stages of individual's life. Now, sport in Islamic country. So there is enough, uh, there is a you know, quite amount of curiosity in sports relation to the Islam uh, since maybe 1980s. And there is a lot of literature available in uh, relation to Islam and teaching physical activities and sports. So after going through uh, literature which is available, it was found that there is a consensus among people which reflects that in Islam and its followers are instructed to get involved in sports, physical activities, and any other form of recreational activities. Many Muslims and uh, they used religious materials like uh, Surah and the Prophet Muhammad's teachings, you know, very often to display a positive side of sports. Even the Islamic literature suggests that Prophet, you know, and the second Khalf Omar bin Khattab recommended that Muslims should teach their children swimming archery and horseback riding. And this is, you know, uh, available in literature and we, we all know that. And they are also encouraged to, uh, you know, take part in uh, competitive sports, you know, and activities. Islamic principles regarding physical body and sports 
has been widely explored by many scholars. For instance, if we look at the Western sports and the way they practice discipline body, along with control of food and fluid intake, is quite in line with the requirement of the Muslims, as stated in Islam, in order to take suitable care of body and also focus you know, on their health. Muslims are supposed to achieve higher standards of strength and physical fitness. And they should be working towards the purification and cleanliness of their soul along with mind and body. Some studies have even tried to find out how closely physical aspects are linked with the Islam. In Islam, people view physical body as entrusted upon them by Allah, have a very specific requirements and needs uh, sh should therefore be taken care of properly in every aspect. Now sports, physical self and Islam. There are again large number of studies which reflects uh, sports and exercise as a perfect way and mean by which Muslims can fulfill and take their needs, uh, take care of the needs required by the body within the realms of Islamic religion. Even in Darul you know, Islam, physical education in sports is given very high priority. In school curriculum, physical education is the second largest subject in terms of the allotted time. And this, is, this shows how significant physical activities are in the life of Muslims, especially in Saudi Arabia, I'm talking uh, with reference to that. Every child gets a significant number of hours of exposure to physical education. While interviewing the children in the school, it was noticed that physical education and sports was accorded second most importance after religious studies. So when I interviewed you know, different uh, 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 students, I interact with youth and then the children, uh, it was revealed that physical education is considered as an integral part of school system and each has a specific place in their everyday activities through which and where they can actually apply their religious beliefs. So what they feel, the, this, this youth at university level and, and at school level, they feel that sports and exercise is a place where actually they can apply their faith and belief, and which is very important you know, from their point of view. As also reported in, in some studies in the past, uh, uh, with understanding and interpretations of the Quran and Sunnah, pupils in the interviews have positively argued that sports and physical exercise was equally significant to them as it is in line with instructions from the Allah. One of the respondent, he believed that his body was a gift from Allah and it is his, respon his responsibility to take care of it. So. This, this reflects you know, the, the mindset of the, of, the, of the people, how they think exercise. So they, they feel that it is their responsibility to take care of their body and exercise and sports are very important you know, aspects you know, uh, towards that. Physical education and sports is seen where people find their self and they reaffirm their values in these activities. Sports and physical activities provide an effective and unbiased environment where youth can channelize their negative energies and emotions as also reported you know, by Moford and McIntosh in their study. When I interviewed some engineering students, because usually you know, these uh, students, they are more, you know, uh, like, uh, more towards academic, they, don't, they, don't, they hardly get any time for you know, activities, but still, you know, what they feel, they feel that how effectively a rigorous game of football refresh their mind and body, and they are able to get away with negative emotions and bad feelings. And there, is, uh, there was this important, you know, and because this peacefulness, you know, become very clear, make them very clear, and they are able to focus, you know, on their task. Another respondent, you know, when I interviewed him, he feels that controlling one's negative feelings and emotions is important from the point of view of Islam, and physical activity helps them to realize, uh, release their ener negative energies and chani channelize them in a positive way. So therefore, the time spent during physical activities and sports is constructive and worth as it allows the release of negativity and it refreshes their soul. OK, 
Okay. Now, sports, discipline, and Islam. Discipline is the key thing that one gets from sports, physical, and sports and physical education activities. So the respondents who are involved in activities, what they feel, they feel that uh, sports as a part of their lifestyle and gave priority to it largely because of the importance of rules and regulations in sports. Because these rules actually which make them disciplined in their lives. And rules in, the, rules in sports forced them to control you know, uh, them in adverse situations, even if they have the negative thoughts and urge. These rules keeps them in control of all these. And this is so important, as stated by many respondents, that they want to be a good Muslim man, and Allah rewards discipline. So sports you know, makes you discipline, and again, it is in, uh, uh, in line with you know, the religious beliefs. So many young Muslims believe that sports help them to control and regulate their bodies, especially you know, uh, in team sports which is important and which can curb and control their emotions and negative feelings, which otherwise would be released in a less appropriate way. Even some respondents, they cite, they cite the quote, they cite and quote references made in hadith, you know, that a strong Muslim is better and more beloved by God than a weak one, even if both are good. So that's why they practice, you know, physical education and activities. So therefore, we can assume from the response of these young uh, Muslim men that they are willing to seek and nurture more self-disciplined life. And the strict and tough regulations of their physical bodies was indispensable for that purpose. So we can therefore argue that many of them feel that through participation in exercise and sports, they can be what Allah wanted them to be. Now, sports social self and Islam. Islam promotes peace, living in unity with each other, especially with your neighbors, irrespective of your differences. And physical activities and sports in particularly, especially in team games and activities, promote these cohesive characteristics. So young Muslims is of view that sports is a way to socialize. And through these social settings, we can rely on each other for their help and support and also to Allah for his spiritual guidance. And all these can be achieved because of a unique relationship within the players, team, and almighty, especially in the team sports. I'll be moving forward because I'm showing that time left is very you know, less. So I'm just skipping some slides, which otherwise could be important for you also. So some of the respondents, you know, again, they understand and accept that it is the God who controls one's fate, and uh, it is applicable to all aspects of Muslims' life. Uh, Muslim men look to Allah for valuable guidance during the time of struggle or unset uncertainty, and this belief is actually uh, inbuilt, you know, uh, within, the, within their identity. So this is what they believe that adherence to religion has more positive impact on sports in terms of values such as fair play and sportsman spirit. Now, uh, in recently in, in Saudi Arabia, the government has taken you know uh, initiative where you know uh, they organized a workshop you know uh, by the Ministry of Education to discuss physical education for improving health of female students. So uh, the discussions revealed that there were uh, 315 nutrition and fitness graduates from Princess Noura University who would be a great benefit in the field of physical education. So the government itself you know, now is you know, more concerned about physical education and sports and health of, of their you know, uh, children and youth. And they are taking it, especially for the female, uh, they are taking one step forward you know, to bring it you know, uh, reality. So they, the plan was uh, to include or introduce physical education as a subject at girls' schools, which is listed as an initiative in the Lifestyle Improvement Program. Also, if I want to give example of my university where I work, that's the King Pahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, it's very important for you to know that although it's an engineering university, but 
we at university we offer every student physical education and health education program it means every student who is enrolled you know in any program they have to undergo compulsorily four semesters of physical education which itself shows the commitment of the government you know uh, towards the health and fitness of their students and with this i would like to conclude my talk and i thank you very much for patience hearing and listening so i will skip the conclusion part so this is i think it's gone <laughs> tell you makashi <laughs> thank you <laughs> this okay thank you dr rakesh for your presentation and our last presentation professor jung sok ok from dankok university south korea will present about kinesiology as a discipline and i will uh, invite mr sure uh, to translate okay Good morning, everyone. I will speak in Korea, so I'd like to Dr. Sri, a professor in Gajamand University, to translate my Korean speech to Indonesian language. Okay. 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 To English? Yes. Uh, 오늘 저는 학문 분야로서의 키네지올로지에 대해서 말씀드리고자 합니다. Yeah, everyone. Good morning. So I'm Professor Ox. I'm going to talk about kinesiology as a discipline. So actually, this is going to be based on English. So I'm just going to uh, to translate back to back when necessary. 여기 보시면 seminars on health, uh, physical education, and uh, sports. 라는 말 말이 있습니다. As we can see on on, on the back our uh, at the front. This is the seminar on health, physical education, mm -hmm. and sports science, as we can see now. And we also heard the, the second speaker that he was talking about the sport medicine, uh, Professor Edward Verhagen. And I'm going to talk about kinesiology, so there must be something related with that. Health, physical education, sports, the sports medicine, so I think it's better for us to think about the relationship between health, physical education, and sports science. 또 인도네시아어로 인도네시아어로 인도네시아 말로 이런 말들을 어떻게 번역을 해야 할 건지 생각해 주시기 바랍니다. Then, and I also hope that all of you start to think about how these three terms health, physical education and sports science are reflected in Bahasa Indonesia or translated in Bahasa Indonesia. He is wondering actually. 키네지올로기 이렇게 받아들일 수도 있겠습니다만은 인도네시아 사이언스 랭귀지를 개발하기 위해서 키네지올로지를 인도네시아 말로 어떻게 번역해야 할 것인가 생각해 주시면 고맙겠습니다. Likewise, I'm also wondering what is it kinesiology in Bahasa Indonesia? So is there such a term for in Bahasa Indonesia for kinesiology? Kinesiology란 말은 미국 에스부터 발생된 것 같은데요. 1960년대 후반부에 과연 피지컬 에듀케이션이 학문이냐 이런 질문이 대두되었습니다. So uh, kinesiology started in the 1960s in the USA. At the time it was started with the simple questions whether kinesiology is one of the physical activities. 이런 질문이 피지컬 에듀케이션 외에 외 분야에서 나무로 해서 피지컬 에듀케이션을 전공하는 
쪽에서 학문화를 시도하기 시작했습니다. And with that questions, we started to think whether kinesiology is why is it become one of the uh, what is it what one of the one of one of the things included in the physical education mm -hmm. at that time. 네, 그러면서 exercise science, sports science를 거쳐서 지금 현재는 kinesiology가 주를 이루고 있는 것 같습니다. And now we, we have. The, all of this we have the term that we can call now at the, at the moment kinesiology. 아, 미국과는 달리 우리 동양에서는 우리 동양에서는 학생들의 취업을 걱정함에 있어서 취업 걱정을 하면서 우리의 학문 분야를 무엇이라고 할 것인가에 대해서 고민하게 되었습니다. Uh, different what happened in Asia in the late 1990s in Asia, we started to think about uh, we, we started to, what to do with the injuries that uh, happened to our our students. So they, they, they started with that mm -hmm. uh, kind of questions, and then just a bit, bit different from what happened in the states. 네, 한국에서만 해도 한국에서만 해도 physical education에 관한 에, 학과들이 80개 80 종류가 넘습니다. Uh, in Korea itself. We have 80 types of physical education department in in Korea. 아마도 세계적으로 따져 보면은 100까지도 넘을 것 같습니다. And I, I think in in the world we have we have more than, we have more than that. 유럽에서는 스포츠 사이언스로 스포츠 와 스포츠 사이언스로 통일이 된것 같습니다. And I think in Europe they call it sports uh, sports science. 미국에서는 키네지올로지로 가고 있습니다. And in the states they call it kinesiology. 우리 동양 아시아에서는 어느 쪽을 택할 것인가를 한번 생각해 보겠습니다. So as in Asia we we, have, we may have to think whether we go to states reference or to the Europe's reference. Kinesiology or sports science. 네, 학문 분야는 대학의 학과 또는 대학의 명칭과 동일해야 된다고 생각합니다. But I think we can we, we, we can refer kinesiology as one of the department in the university, for instance. 또그 학문을 전공한 전문가의 명칭과 연관성이 높아야 된다고 생각합니다. So, uh, I'm sorry, one second. 아, 또그 학문을 전공한 mm -hmm. 전문가의 명칭과도 연관이 돼야 된다고 생각합니다. So there might be some relation that those who are graduated from this department they can become an expert in kinesiology when they, when they graduate from this department. 에, 그런 관점에서 멘디에 인도네시아로 학문 분야, 학과 명칭, 전, 전문가 명칭을 어떻게 해야 될 건지 한번 답을 구해 보시기 바랍니다. So from this perspective, I'm also wondering what about in Indonesia? Whether you can make kinesiology as one of the department or one of the education, and, and to to breed some expert on on kinesiology. 네. 미국에서는 미국에서는 1904년에 National Academy of Kinesiology가 생기고 캐나다 또 지금은 American Kinesiology Association이 생겨서 활동을 하고 있습니다. As we can as we can see on the yeah. on the slide show there, yeah, yeah. Uh, in North America, 1904 it started with National Academy of Kinesiology, and mm -hmm. then, I'm sorry. So for the last yeah. time in 2007, they had they established American Kinesiology Association. 그리고 Asian Society of Kinesiology가 2000 2016년에 설립되었습니다. Especially, please take a look at the Asia, Asian Society of Kinesiology (ASK) in Asia, established in 2016. AKA American Kinesiology Association의 정의하기를 Kinesiology is the study of physical activity and its impact on health, society, and quality of life. As we can see here, uh, based on the American Kinesiology Association, kinesiology is the study of physical activity and its impact on health, society, and quality of life. Kanogun, the study of human movement, 
이렇게 말하는 사람들도 있습니다. And there are some people who consider kinesiology as the study of movement, people's movement. 키네지올로지에서 말하는 피지컬 액티비티는 다음과 같습니다. So as we can see, we're going to we're going to look at our types of physical activities included in kinesiology. Everyday life is 포함되고. Of course, everyday life. Uh, physical labor, exercise, sports, and read activity. 그리고 creative activity. 무용 같은 활동들도 포함됩니다. Uh, apart from what we stated here, uh, he, man, he emphasized on the last one, creative activity. So he said that even dancing is also included in this type of physical activities. Kinesiology uh, 학문의 목표는 safe, effective, and efficient physical activity를 발, 발견하고 개발하는 것입니다. And, and these are the objective of kinesiology. So we can see that safe, effective, and efficient mm -hmm. physical activities. 에, 에, 그런 활동을 통해서 어, 바람직한 발육 발달 또 탁월한 능력 또 건강하게 늙고 편하게 죽을 수 있는 것을 목표로 합니다. Right. From, from these activities, we hope that we can grow and then develop ourselves as a human, and that we can show our uh, uh, high performance as as a living living persons, and also we can grow old healthily and then well dying. Kinesiology와 관련된 기초 과목들은 다음과 같습니다. So, and this are uh, what makes kine what are the basis. That comes that that makes up the terms kinesiology. Uh, functional anatomy, exercise physiology, biomechanics, motor language control, or humanity, culture, and behavioral science in kinesiology. 이런 것들이 있습니다. And all, all okay. these five yeah. are the knowledge base in kinesiology. 그 외에도 그 외에도 나라 국가에 따라서. 중요시 할수 있는 과목들이 있겠습니다. And I think based on where kinesiology is located depends on its country that they might have at some other knowledge bases to come up with kinesiology depending on the country where it, mm. where it is. 음. 에, 키네지올로지를 전공한 예, 학생들이 나아갈 수 있는 분야와 관련돼서 이런 응용 분야들이 있겠습니다. So, uh, there are also some students in particular country uh, who study in what is it, in physical education. A Kumil seminar is now health, uh, physical education, sports, athletic training, clinical exercise, human engineering. 이런 것들은 응용 분야라고 할수 있겠습니다. And so we, as what we are doing at the moment. So we are, we are talking today actually it's applied, applied, applied knowledge of this kinesiology. And so there must be something uh, other applied, applied kinesiology that we can talk about out of this. Mm. So once again, I want to emphasize that this and then what we've been talking today is going to be applied kinesiology or maybe something else more than this. And these are when you study kinesiology, there are a lot of uh, career or jobs that you can do based on kinesiology. Mm -hmm. 의학, 의학 분야에서도 운동 프로그램이 많이 생기고 있습니다. Yeah, of course, we, we mostly talk about the sport when we talk about kinesiology. 이런 관점에서 Asian Society of, Society of Kinesiology에서는 학문 활동을 하면서 어, 키네지올로지 
이를 전공하는 학생들의 자격 제도를 개발하고자 합니다. So as we can see here, one of the purpose of the ASK is to, pro, uh, to provide uh, in-depth exchange information, experiences, even among students who study kinesiology. Mm. 그 자격 제도들은 네, 다양한 자격 제도를 통합한 Integrated Kinesiology Qualification System이라고 명명하고 있습니다. And, and we also have to know that there is a IQQS, Integrated Kinesiologist Qualification System. 예를 들면 미국의 NSCA, ACSM, NATA, NASM 단체 개발하는 자격증들을 통합한다고 생각하시면 되겠습니다. As we can see here, there are a lot of diverse uh, diversity in the qualification system, like the one that we can see up front. 에, 그런 IKQS를 위한 참고 문헌들을 나열해 놨습니다. Yeah, please take a look at this. this is for for your 음. reference if you 음. if you if you're interested. 에, 그리고 2020년도에 2020년도 8월 달에 8월 달에 이곳 쪽 자카르타에서 에이션 컨퍼런스 온 키네졸로지 약간은 컨퍼런스를 할 계획입니다. And we are we are going to hold the international conference on kinesiology in Yogyakarta in 2020. 또 에이션 소사이어트 키네졸로지에서 1년에 네 번씩 발간하는 에이션 저널 오브 키네졸로지입니다. Also, also if you're interested, we also publish a quarter a quarterly journal on kinesiology. 여러분들이 많은 투구를 기대합니다. So I hope that you can publish yours in this journal. 처음에 질문 드렸던 키네졸로지를 인도네시아로 어떻게 번역하면 좋겠는지 생각해 보셨습니까? Okay. Now I'm going to ask you again my first question. What is it kinesiology in Bahasa Indonesia? 우리 그 A professor Department of Korean Language at Kajimandu University. 우리 닥터 수라이 박사께서 어, 키네지올로지에 대한 인도네시아어를 제안하실 수 있겠습니까? He's asking me what is it in Bahasa Indonesia. I don't know. I need help. Oh, right. I could help. 일무 그라 움직임의 학이라고 합니다. So 일무 그라이라고 합니다. 교수님. 움직임. 일무 그라 움직임의 학이라고 합니다. 여러분들 동의하실런지요? So you really Asian now. <laughs> if, if you agree with that, <laughs> if you agree with that, okay. 긴 시간 동안 경청해 주셔서 고맙습니다. Okay, thank you for your attention. 땡큐 프로페서 옥. And we already hear all presentation by the experts person. And now we come to question and answer session. And I will open in this first term, I will open three questions for three person. And please don't forget to mention your name and your institution. Okay? Uh, that one, uh, ladies in the back, and Professor Ferrander, and also uh, with, yeah, the man, yes, good, with white shirt. Okay. Uh, excuse me, uh, a committee, please help yeah, yeah, the ladies too. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, Professor yeah. Ferrander first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Good morning to everybody. It's a very happy moment for me to be here. Uh, 
there is a question to uh, professor uh, yeah bidil swart bidil the first session sir was talking about the depression so uh, i would like to know the uh, what kind of uh, depression was uh, identified is endogenous or exogenous because there are various types of depressions are there so what is the tool used uh, for assessing the uh, depression uh wait we first collect the question first okay uh the next question question in oh. the ladies in the back Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rina from, uh, from UNJ, State University of Jakarta. My question for Mr. Effort, I have a two questions. One, how to restore the confidence of the professional athlete who has recovered from the injured? And second one, what the percentage of the combination between training rehabilitation and the therapies was the athletes is uh, they get injured no i mean my question is for example the athlete get injured and then how to make divide percentage between the rehabilitation training and the therapies with the equipment so how to combine how many present uh, percentage because normally when the athlete get injured they have a programs in one week maybe three time for the rehabilitation program with the training and then the other one with the kind of the therapies thank you okay thank you okay the last one yes Thank you very much. My name is Jafet Ndaisenga. I come from in Africa, but just now I study in Universitas Neger Yogyakarta. My first question is related to the last presenter. It is one who has present about kinesiology. So, yeah. And this is one. I would like to know, is there any difference between kinesiology and biomechanic. And if it's different, so referring to the definition, I would like to know if is there any difference between kinesiology and, and biomechanic. And we have seen that in, the, in his presentation, there is clinical exercise and sport medicine as the basic of kinesiology. So what about with physiotherapy? If clinical exercise and sport medicine, if it is related with kinesiology, and what about physiotherapy? And the last is related to the second presenter. So we know uh, the injuries or the trauma it, there is no way to, to escape of them. We, we like or not, the injury must appear. But, and you know that in the world, uh, world the, uh, many uh, universities, they are leaving a wreck of equipment and, for example, uh, what, uh, a wreck of teachers who are, have a speciality in, uh, in the treating of injury. So, According to the presenter, how we can take off the uh, injury while many universities, they still leaving a wreck of equipment for, uh, to get the knowledge which is enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have uh, three person that uh, asked to Professor Stewart, 
and Professor Evert and uh, Professor Oak for this first term. Maybe uh, Professor Stewart, uh, you can answer first. If I understand the question, it was about sources of depression and uh, types of depression and what the evidence is for that. Uh, through those reviews, we, we were not able to identify specifically those types of depression you mentioned. What I will say is that um, you know, depression can vary from subclinical to, to clinical depression, and uh, you know, subclinical will be just general mood shifts. Uh, the evidence, of course, as you would expect, is much stronger for those with higher levels of depression. But anyway, I'll, I'll happily uh, chat uh, afterwards about some of the, the more detailed results. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor. And for the... Question about the kinesiology and different... the. Uh, be between kinesiology and biomechanic and the position of the physiotherapy, maybe Professor Ock will answer it. Uh, Historically, in the 1960s and 70s, there was no in the So, Biomechanics 내용을 상당 부분 포함하고 있었는데 포함하고 있었습니다. 네. 음. 아, 뭐? 네. 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 1960년대 말부터 1970년대 초반부에는 바이오메카닉스라는 그런 분야가 없었습니다. 네. At, uh, in the, at the end of 1960s and the early 1970s, there was no such term as biomechanics. Yeah. Now, at the moment, since that time there was no such a term as biomechanics, now this biomechanics is included in the kinesiology. So, 의미로 생각할 때 바이오메카닉스와 혼돈하는 그런 경우가 있습니다. 다시 한번 해서. 예, 키네지올로지의 영역을 좁게 좁게 볼때 바이오메카닉스하고 이렇게 혼돈되는 경우가 있습니다. Uh, so if, if we take a look at this, uh, we, we can uh, we, we could not what is it uh, mix it up between biomechanics and kinesiology. 예, 예, 그러나 지금은 바이오메카닉스는 키네지올로지라는 그런 학문 분야의 한 서브젝트 과목이라고 생각하시면 되겠습니다. So we can, uh, but now we can tell, although we cannot mix it up, biomechanics is one of the um, yeah. under the kinesiology term. Yeah. Okay. If you you can think that way. 키네지올로지가 yeah. 훨씬 넓은 범위에. Because kinesiology is much more wider than biomechanics in this term. 그리고 유럽의 피지오테라피스트 어, 하고 키네지올로지 사이의 관계를 물으신 것 같습니다. And what in Europe? I'm sorry. 아, 유러, 유럽의 피지오테라피스. Okay. There is a one uh, physiotherapist 음. in Europe. 에, 유럽의 피지오테라피스트들은 키네지올로지를 많이 공부하는 것 같습니다. And at the time those physiotherapists in Europe they learn a lot about kinesiology. 또 미, 미국의 피지컬 피지컬 세라피스트도 키네지올로지를 많이 공부하고 있습니다. Whereas in the states the the physical therapist they they also learn about the kinesiology. 그, 그, 에, 그래서 우리가 우리가 공부하는 키네지올로지가 여러 분야에 의학 분야에도 이런 기초 지식을 제공할 수 있다고 생각합니다. Okay. So what we are learning about kinesiology at the moment, including the, med the, the medical knowledge, uh, mm. we, can, we, we can say that kinesiology is only, only mm. one small part mm. of, of, of this knowledge. Yeah. Uh, I hope it answered your questions. Thank you.
one. Professor Oak, there is one more question about that. Maybe related? Okay. Uh, very good morning. I am Dr. Pasudi from India. This question is only for Rakesh Tomar. University you have mentioned only for Muslims. They are disciplined and they are good performance in the world. No, I am basically uh, from Indians. You, you know the Vedic period, British period, and Muslim period, and Hindu period, and all are there. They are dedicated for this sports field. Go far in the, uh, what do you say, uh, this is uh, 1896 in modern Olympics, and we come from that, all the periods. We have mentioned only one Muslim period, sir. Kindly. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor. I will keep the question, and uh, now we continue first to the Professor effort. I have three questions to answer, um, but I think they can be reduced um, to two. So I, I'll start in the back end. There was actually two questions that, that go into one. The first question you asked was like, how do we get the athlete to, to be less fearsome for re-injuries again and, and be confident again that they can perform and how do we need to balance training and rehabilitation was correct, yeah. right? I think they go hand in hand. Um, and, and this is the exciting part, I think, of where sports and exercise medicine at the moment is. It's not black and white anymore. We used to read things in manuscripts and try to put that in practice, but we already learned a long time ago that that doesn't work. And we're try finally trying to get practice and science together and learning that the real expertise is in practice. And science is just helping us to get there. So where we were in the old days, saying about return to play. So we had rehabilitation, and then at a certain moment in time, the, 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 the physical therapist or the doctor would say, okay, now you can go back to play. And then it's hands off and do all you can. And I can imagine then a lot of times re-injuries occur and the athlete is not really feeling confident that they are returning um, safely. But that has changed. We're not talking about return to play in the black and white vision anymore. It's return to training, return to um, full training, return to performance. There's a gradation in there. And in that gradation, you need to take the, the, the athlete by hand. So when there's an injury, it depends on the injury what the rehabilitation phase is. But it also depends on the athlete what the rehabilitation phase is in the beginning. The athlete is at 100%. When they get injured, they go to 50, 60, maybe if the injury is less of 80. And you as, as a doctor needs to say, okay, this is the amount of time I need to get you back to a level where you can start training again. And then you need to monitor that, of course. So you need to guide them by the hand and talk to the coach and talk also to the strength and conditioning coach, what is a good load that is um, healthy and beneficial for the athlete at that time. And the thing is, a lot of the things you in your rehabilitation protocol are doing are also strength and conditioning and, and motor control exercises that they also do in training. So I don't think you can talk nowadays anymore about so much percentage of training, so much percentage of rehabilitation. It's all integrated. You can talk to the strength and conditioning coach and the strength exercises you would normally give from a physical therapist perspective can also be integrated in the program the strength and conditioning coach is given. Um, the same goes with the coach when they do a program on uh, certain tactics or a program on uh, skills. In that you can integrate neuromotor control exercises. But that demands you to have an open communication with the team and talk about each individual athlete at their own individual level. Now I know that kind of frictions sometimes because if you have a team sport, you know, all the players need to be on the field and actually learn the same thing. So you, it's your job as the sports and exercise medicine specialist to balance that for that specific athlete. 
And if you do that well, you build a band of trust. And with that band of trust, if you guide the athlete really well from injury to back to return to performance, full performance, then they know that they are ready to go because you help them get there. And it doesn't mean it has to be a straight line up. Maybe you need to take a little step back if they react negatively to a certain exercise or to a certain um, approach you're taking. And I think that is answering both questions in one. It's your job to build that band of trust and it's your job to guide the individual athlete in that team perspective as good as you can to return to performance. And before that, you need to make a lot of decisions. And I don't like to talk in percentages, I like to talk in outcomes and function. What do you want to achieve and how can you achieve it with a normal routine? I hope that answers it. Um, and the other question was, why are we still trying to prevent injuries if we know injuries are part of the game? Is that correct? I don't, I did it in this presentation, but I don't normally like to talk about injury prevention. No, risks are there, and we know they are bound to happen. And we can't prevent these risks, I fully agree. I usually talk about risk management, because we know the risk is here if we don't do anything. But we also know that if we guide the athletes well, we can get the risk to negative effects down. And probably we're not even preventing injuries in that sense, but probably what we are doing is preventing a lot of the performance limitating pains and function um, uh, affections. So if, if you run on a field and you step in a little ditch, you likely will sprain your ankle. How strong your ankle is, how strong your muscles are, how good your neuromotor control is, probably that will happen. But if you already have a pain and you do a full out sprint, and your hamstring snaps, we could have managed that risk by proper guidance and proper monitoring. We can guide the player and say, okay, there's a little pain there, so we need to be careful. Maybe we, at the beginning of a season, do not put you in the game, because this is not a good idea right now. We train a bit further, and then when the season progresses, we put you in the game. So if we take that concept more from the risk management perspective, knowing the risks are there, but trying to manage it, which we also do in occupational settings, I think that provides a better approach. And that also provides a better efficient way of putting our funds into guiding athletes to the optimal performance, instead of looking at, you will get injured, which we can never tell, so I'm gonna do something to you. It's like, okay guys, we're all getting injured somewhere during our careers, let's make sure we deal with it. And I think that's a more sensible approach. Okay, clear? Uh, this is Lina. Clear? It's okay. Thank you, Professor Everett. And now I will open the second term of this session. Uh, we already have one question for Prof. Uh, Dr. Rakas. And okay, I will open in that side and in the middle side. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eka Novita. I'm a member of Sport Science Faculty, Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta. Uh, my question goes to Prof. Stewart and Prof. Ivert. Uh, I'm still confused because lately I've heard a statement, uh, fit and fat, about fit and fat, <laughs> uh, that I think it can mislead uh, the society or the people with new self-image concept because in my uh, opinion uh, the people will had an argument to engage with sport or, an, or any certain activity because uh, in their mind it's okay to be fat while I feel fit something like that and uh, it uh, for us as sport practitioners it's a uh, give double challenge to engage the society, the, the people, uh, especially women, <laughs> to doing sport or physical activity. Uh, meanwhile, in my uh, uh, opinion, body composition and fat percentage is 
one of health related physical fitness indicator that's for prof Stewart. Uh, i maybe what is your explanation about that and for prof effort maybe you can explain uh, how to increase increase people awareness that obesity is very close related with injury thank you very much okay uh, thank you this is a kind of fita and okay the third person from middle of the table terima kasih thank you good morning everyone my question will goes to professor Stewart. Uh, and name and your institution uh, first. I'm so, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Hisa Arianto from uh, UNY, Yogyakarta. Uh, my question will go to Professor Stewart, and it will be great if uh, Dr. Rakesh also gave response. In your study, is, is culture, or social, and economic have a role in interaction between physical activity, physical activity and mental health? Is, is there any any role played on national culture, national social economics, and uh, anyone else? And um, maybe also Dr. Rakesh will respond about the context in uh, Saudi Arabia in terms of uh, the recently policy about the, the, the they allow women to, to participate in public space and in in the physical activities in the public space, how it how it uh, related to the uh, what what you presented in Muslim and physical activities and the other things. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I still open uh, question for this term. Anyone? Okay, please. Um, my name is Inaro Talaili. I'm from um, Ryu University uh, Medical Center. My question is for uh, Professor Everett. Um, it is interesting that you have the uh, different approaches in detecting the injuries among athletes, uh, professional athletes in Netherlands. Um, and one of it was uh, we knew that the rate of injuries become increased when they report their injuries uh, using the emails. My question is, um, is it directly only by email or you have an application, as, uh, something like that? And then um, the email, email, is it only to the medical doctor or is it to the other system of um, the, for the athletes like the physiotherapists and also the coaches? Because um, one good thing is they are, the other people are also aware of the injury. But how about the privacy of the athlete? Because there is also a concern about medical um, privacy. So that is my question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Laili. And I still open for the last question in this term. Okay. Last question. Uh, please. Committee. Thank you very much. My name is Ariati. I am from UNJ. Uh, I have a question for uh, for the presenter who come from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I know Islam is way of life and we know the exercise is very important in our life. When I see uh, from your community, look you in general, how important is exercise. But in the fact, a lot of women or men, special women, lack of exercise because I see a lot of uh, a lot of restriction 
on the activity they want to do. For example, the music. So how to give them knowledge? Because in Indonesia, I'm glad, all they really well on the exercise, they're looking for a better a performance in their life. And Indonesia is the most population for Muslim, and they're really happy to do the exercise to support our religion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And I will invite Dr. Rakesh Tomar first to answer the questions. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, first, with regard to the question from the discipline. Uh, of course, you know, we all know that we learn discipline, you know, through sports and games, in, you know. But my presentation was purely, you know, from the perspective of Islam, okay? So that's why I restricted, you know, to that only. I didn't talk about, you know, how others, community, they feel, how you learn. So this is purely from the perspective of the Islam, the students, you know, how they feel, you know, how uh, that, how the discipline, you know, make them closer, you know, uh, to their faith, you know, in, in Saudi Arabia. Thank you. And uh, about the questions, you know, on uh, like two questions, one question about the female participation in sports, and this gentleman also, he made one question almost similar to you, how, how they look at the, you know, uh, females. Of course, what you are, uh, we all know that, you know, that there are, there are decisions, you know, about females, you know, participation, but recently, if you see in my last slide, I mentioned about the government initiative. So very recently, just a few months back, the Ministry of Education in Saudi Arabia, they held a workshop and uh, in which, you know, the, the motive was how they can promote physical education in the girls' school. So they are hiring, you know, maybe probably if uh, I can just look back at the statistics, you know, uh, they, are, they, are, they are training 17,655 uh, female education teachers, you know, and uh, uh, and from this 17,655 female teachers, you know, uh, uh, 9,000 of them are like you know uh, primary school teachers, and 8,655 are elementary and secondary school teachers. So they are very much, of course, they are concerns, and they are looking into these concerns. And this is this is very welcome step from the government. And of course, things takes time to improve. And this is an initial step taken by the government, and I hope you now it will go long, you know, and. Uh, and th that's what, you know, uh, in, in, uh, uh, th th they have, you know, a program called Lifestyle Improvement Program for Female. So this is just an, you know, part of that, you know, uh, one part of that program. So I hope, you know, you will hear, you know, much more, you know, uh, positive feedback in, in coming years. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rakesh. And now I will invite Professor Stewart to answer the question. Yeah, thank you. There were a couple of questions for me. Um, so I will try and pass the exam. <laughs> so the first one was about being fit and fat. Uh, I don't claim to be that expert on this topic, but what I do know is that uh, I think this concept first started through Stephen Blair and his work with the uh, Aerobics Institute um, cohort where he tested a lot of people for their physical fitness over many years and of course had lots of other measures and found that some of the health outcomes were quite strongly dependent on your physical fitness, particularly your aerobic fitness. Um, I wouldn't say independently, but somewhat independently of your body composition. So in other words, there was a small group of, and they were males in the initial cohort, there were a small percentage of males who were classified as well, certainly overweight and, and, and uh, predominantly obese, but had quite high levels of physical fitness. 
And of course, this could be a function of either genetics or uh, lifestyle. And so this led to the term being fit and fat. And then subsequently, researchers looked at the idea of being metabolically healthy, obese. So you're obese, but you're metabolically healthy. And that, that, that can be true, of course. Um, so that, that's my limited knowledge of, of that. But I, I think what I, I've read recently, and, and there's a lot of controversy about this, is that while there will be people like that, um, it's still very clear that higher levels of, of obesity um, are pretty detrimental to health. Um, so I don't think we should fool ourselves that um, being obese is, is healthy if, if you have a, a level of physical fitness um, because there'll be probably a lot of other things going on un underneath that, that we don't notice. Um, having said that, I, I would caution against an overemphasis on body shape and, and body weight uh, as an indicator of health. Um, there are lots of other indicators of health uh, in addition to our body composition. So that's a pretty complex area and uh, my, my knowledge is, is a little limited. The second question was around um, social, cultural, economic uh, factors alongside um, the research that we looked at on physical activity and mental health in young people. It's a really good question because uh, the vast majority of the primary studies that, that become part of the systematic reviews are from a limited number of cultures and social and economic contexts. They tend to be from high income or Western countries. And so it's a very good question and we don't know how um, some of those other, uh, other countries, say low and middle income countries or countries that adopt uh, quite different uh, cultural practices than, than uh, the ones in those studies. We don't really know how the relationship between physical activity and mental health might, might uh, be in those countries. Uh, what I will say is that it's an underdeveloped area of research, particularly around uh, social, economic, uh, factors. Uh, for, for, for example, I, I heard a very, very interesting presentation at a conference in London last week around social inequality and health. This is general health, not just mental health. And, you know, the countries that have the lowest gap between the low income and high income in, in a country, that have the smallest gap. I believe Japan is one, and Norway, Sweden, some of the Scandinavian countries um, do extremely well on a lot of health indicators. Uh, and this is very wide indicators, not just physical health or even not just mental health. And some countries that have rather wide gaps between the lowest and the highest income, uh, such as the UK and the United States, um, uh, show a number of very poor indicators of health. Um, so I think that's a really interesting area for the future and I think the evidence is pretty clear that we need to reduce that, uh, that health gap, that's, that, that income gap actually, to, to reduce the uh, social inequalities. So that's a very complex area and uh, uh, yet again I don't claim great expertise but it's a really good question and one we should pursue more in the future. That's probably about all I can say on, the, on those issues. Uh, professor? Uh, maybe uh, due to the culture, socio-economic, and etc., uh, do you have uh, opinion or suggestion about the strategy to involving women in sport in the developing country, like in Indonesia? Maybe. Yeah, typically we find in uh, large international surveys and national surveys that that males are more active than females. Whether that's a function of the way we measure these things is, is sometimes debated. Uh, but if there is an underrepresentation of females in, in participation, this may be strongly uh, socially and culturally determined, of course. 
I'm not really sure I feel comfortable making suggestions for countries and cultures of which I'm, I, I have very limited expertise. Um, but it, you know, even in countries like uh, the, the ones I'm more familiar with, like Australia and the UK, uh, there is a strong push now through mass media and through programs to get more females involved in physical activity, whether that's sport or whether it's uh, more general physical activity. And uh, you know, one of the things that they've done in that is to show very strong role models uh, and to make it very socially acceptable for those groups to be involved. And if you want to have a look at some excellent mass media, then Sport England, the organization for sport in, in England, <laughs> that's logical, um, have some very good mass media that's just come out. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it's Girls Can, I think is the, is the program. Um, that might be worth looking at. It, it, it's um, culturally a little different from here, but uh, maybe some underlying principles would be the same. So good role modeling, um, modeling of people by different ages, different ethnic backgrounds, different physical uh, stature and capability. Um, where and, and of course diverse range of activities that people can choose from so don't expect everybody to like the same thing um, so that's probably the best I can do there will be examples around the world that we we can start learning from okay thank you professor and last question for professor Eva please Uh, it's an interesting discussion. There's a bit of sociology, public health, economics. Now back to sports science, sports medicine. Um, but actually, the first question relates um, also, I think, to public health. That was on how do we mitigate the risks of injury in people with obesity, correct? I would actually say it should be the other way around. Um, if you look at the literature, Overweight, overweight, obesity, I don't know, has never been linked to an increased injury risk as an independent risk factor. Yes, people have overweight, they participate in sports and they sustain maybe more injuries than individuals without overweight, but it's never been shown that it's actually due to weight. We see a similar pattern in injury risk with non-overweight people who go from inactivity to activity. And if non-overweight people have the same increase in risk, how can overweight then be the culprit there? We, we tend to think it's more motor control and also load capacity, so your strength and your ability to deal with that increased load. Um, so in, instead of having a black and white view of you need to go and do participation in sports uh, or physical activity, we need to teach people to become more active and do sports in a safe and sound way. And then instead of telling people with obesity that they have an increased risk, we should do it the other way around. We should tell them, well, you do not have an increased risk because your weight is too high. You have an increased risk because you are not adjusted and attuned yet to doing physical activity at a certain level. So if we do that gradually and we help you to get to a certain level, you will see that Oh, your, your obesity will decline, you will see you'll feel better, and we can do that without any additional risk to the normal risk as anybody else. So I think that's a much better message to give, a positive frame instead of that negative frame like nothing will happen. So um, I think we need to shift that around. I hope that answers. And the other one, another topic, ethics and, and research ethics and privacy. Um, that is a big issue in Europe now. Um, and the data I've shown you was before the new privacy law, which was a big problem for us, I must say that. For those who do not know, the EU last June um, put into place a new uh, privacy law that allows us not to do anything anymore, basically. Um, we cannot have data stored on servers that are located outside the European Union. Um, we cannot have data 
that is directly linked to individuals. We cannot, um, if a participant like an athlete says, you need to take me out of the database, we need to do that immediately without further questions. And not even anonymized data we can keep then. So that was a big headache. Um, so we changed our system a bit. We do emails instead of apps, because if you do it via the app, the data is not protected. Via email it does, because people, the, the athletes click on a link, and they go straight to a protected server. So that's one, that's why we do it via emails. We can also do it on paper, it's just four questions. Like, did you have a health problem last week? Did that health problem affect your performance? Did you adapt or just uh, adjust your training volume? And how much of a burden did you have individually from that health problem? And if they report anything, we ask further than what it is and what, what happened. Did you get treatment? How many days could you not participate? So we ask further then. So most athletes are done within two minutes because they just answer no problems. Um, but via email is much easier because these athletes are scattered around the country. We are following 800 athletes right now at the moment. So imagine sending them paper versions and getting them back and put them in the computer. So via email is just much more easy for us and we can send automated reminders. Um, but then what we do with the data, that's the privacy thing. I'm the only one who has access to it. So they send their responses to me personally. And I anonymize those data. So I take away the names, I take away the sports, I put codes in all the names. Then we press a few buttons in an Excel form on my computer, not on a server. And we generate reports by sport because those numbers then are linked in a, in a protected sheet to, to sports and individuals. So we generate a report. And that report I then hand over personally in a PDF form to the medical team. So I and the medical team are the only ones who have access to the data. No one else can access it. Or you need to know the password of my computer and the password of the file. And that's the only way we can operate this system now. We're still trying to find a way around it, but it's, it's nearly impossible. So it's just hand work. Downside is it's a lot of work. Upside is you know exactly what's going on, in whom, and may also why most of the cases, because you know the preceding data as well, and we, you, you, can just, you, you can just see it. And you know the people personally, the athletes personally, and that will help a lot. And maybe that also relates to my previous answer on, on the return to, to performance. It's about that human interaction. We tend to make it easy for ourselves with emails, like we do with the system, and then we reduce the athlete to a number in our data set, but the athlete is still an individual, and an injury is more than that ligament that is sprained. So there's a whole thing around it. And I think with the system we have it now, although it's time consuming and, and hours consuming, it gives us that more holistic approach that is really beneficial for the athlete in the end. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Evert. And that brings us to the end of this session. And I try to conclude uh, first uh, the summary or conclusion from the Professor Stewart that uh, he already present about the strong evidence physical activity associated with the cognitive function, especially in decreasing depression and anxiety. And Professor Evert uh, also talked about the sports medicine in risk management and rehabilitation with the holistic approach can support the athlete to get the optimal performance. Dr. Rakas Tomar, uh, already talked about a uh, strong relationship between the Islam or Muslim and the importance of the physical activity and physical fitness in our daily life. And Professor Oak 
uh, talk about kinesiology as a discipline, the definition, association, working area, certification, and the organization. Maybe you uh, interesting to join the ASEAN Kinesiology Association. You can uh, directly message to the Professor Ok. And we have an uh, Asian Kinesiology Conference uh, in Yogyakarta in 2020. And, okay, let us show our appreciation by giving our speaker a big applause. And on behalf of the committee, I uh, want to uh, thank you to all speaker. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the first session. My, I uh, have a round of big applause to the presenters. Please be well informed that lunch break has been served to you in the restaurant on the first floor. And um, the committee have prepared a praying room available in this floor. And if you want to go to the mosque, you can go to the nearest or closest mosque, Masjid Dinas Pekerjaan Umum, five minutes from here. And also, please be well informed that panel presentations and discussion session two will be started at 1 p.m. right here also in this room. Please enjoy the lunch break. Yang kami hormati Bapak Ibu peserta seminar internasional, kami mengumumkan bahwa Lunch break sudah disediakan di restoran di lantai satu. Bapak Ibu yang bagi bapak-bapak yang akan melakukan sholat Jumat dapat sholat Jumat di lantai ini atau menuju masjid terdekat dari hotel ini yaitu Masjid Dinas Pekerjaan Umum 5 menit dari hotel ini di sebelah kiri. Kami juga menginformasikan bahwa panel presentation dan discussion session 2 akan dimulai pada jam 1. Terima kasih. Please be well informed that lunch break has been served to you in the restaurant on the first floor. Sudah disiapkan untuk uh, makan siang di restoran di lantai satu. Dan untuk yang melaksanakan sholat Jumat, sudah disediakan ruangan di lantai ini. Atau bila ingin pergi ke masjid terdekat di masjid di Dinas Pekerjaan Umum 5 menit dari hotel ini. Terima kasih.
Thank you. 